welcome ranking member Marchant, members of the subcommittee, hearing witnesses, and all of those in attendance. Let me welcome you to the subcommittee on the federal workforce, postal service, and the District of Columbia hearing on the postal service planning for the 21st century. Hearing no objection, the chair, ranking member, and subcommittee members will each have five minutes to make opening statements, and all members will have three days to submit statements for the record. Uh, as I indicated, we are delighted that all of you are here, and I will begin the hearing. Ranking member Marchant, members of the subcommittee, and hearing witnesses, welcome to the subcommittee's hearing on the infrastructure and realignment of the United States Postal Service. Today's hearing will examine the Postal Service's efforts to update outdated mail delivery standards and how it intends to realign its infrastructure through consolidating operations and closing annexes. The Postal Service's delivery performance standards and results are central to its mission of providing reliable and efficient postal service. Standards are essential to setting realistic expectations for delivery performance and expectations. Timely and reliable reporting of performance results is essential for oversight, transparency, and accountability. Mail delivery standards are important so the postal service and officials can monitor the progress of mail delivery in cities like Chicago that are working to improve mail service. The Postal Service has informed me that based on an increased focus on mail processing and delivery performance, Chicago performance showing scores are showing a positive trend. The Postal Service recognizing the importance of the timely delivery of mail has integrated performance targets and results for some types of mail into its performance management system. However, all mail should be subject to mail standards. A decline in first class mail due to increased competition and shifts in population demographics has resulted in the Postal Service examining ways to realign its infrastructure. I'm interested in hearing how the Postal Service intends to realign its workforce, processing, and distribution infrastructure to address these concerns. At the request of myself and other members of Congress, the Government Accountability Office, GAO, has completed its report on the Postal Service's realignment efforts. The report entitled U.S. Postal Service mail process and realignment efforts underway need better integration and explanation, discusses among other things the need for the Postal Service to establish measurable targets to meet cost savings goals and establish criteria for selecting facilities for consolidation and realignment. The report will be released today and will contribute greatly to today's discussion. I want to thank you all again and look forward to testimony from our witnesses. At this time, I'd like to yield to the ranking member, Mr. Marchant. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chairman Davis, for holding the hearing today about uh, the U.S. Postal Service infrastructure and realignment. I understand that with any organization as large as the Postal Service, changes take time and, and a great effort from many diverse groups. As we continue our role on the subcommittee in providing oversight of the Postal Service, I am reminded it is not a perfect system, but one which is ever-changing and expanding. But we can't expect, expect a system which moves 213 billion pieces of mail a year to be perfect or stagnant. With the recent enactment of postal reform legislation, as well as the current challenges faced by the Postal Service, today's Postal Services faces many more challenges than ever before, but through such challenges come opportunity. I look forward to hearing from all of the witnesses today and learning more about the Postal Service and what it can do to maintain a viable delivery system in the 21st century. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Marchant. And we will now um, hear from our witnesses. And first, I'd like to introduce the first panel. Panel one is Ms. Catherine Cigarette, is director of the Physical Infrastructure Issues Team at the Government Accountability Office, GAO. She has directed GAO's work on postal issues for several years, including recent reports on delivery standards and performance, processing network realignment, contracting policies, semi-postal stamps, and biological threats. We welcome you. Mr. Gordon Milburn III was named Assistant Inspector General for Audit of the U.S. Postal Service Office of Inspector General in February of 2005. He is responsible for all audits in the Postal Service areas of cooperations, financial management, technology, and headquarter operations. If the witnesses would uh, rise, it is the tradition of this committee to swear in all witnesses, and so if you would raise your right hand, you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. The record will show that each one of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. You may be seated. Thank you very much, and we will begin with Ms. Cigarette. Chairman Davis, Ranking Member Marchant, Mr. McHugh, thank you for your invitation to appear today at this hearing on the Postal Service and its planning for the 21st century. My remarks reflect reports we issued in 2005, 2006, and at this hearing today. On that basis, my statement will focus on, first, major challenges affecting the service's mail processing operations that have prompted the need for network realignment. Second, concerns we raised in our 2005 report and today's report about the service's efforts to realign its mail processing network and implement its area mail processing consolidations. And finally, concerns we raised in our 2006 report about the service's progress in implementing delivery performance information. Mr. Chairman, there is broad agreement on the service's need to realign its processing networks. In addition to many of today's witnesses, the President's Commission and the service's own transformation plan have called for action to assure that this network meets current and future processing needs reduces costs, improves efficiency, and eliminates redundancy. The Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act reinforced the urgency of this realignment network effort. We found that several trends have created excess capacity in the network and productivity variations across plants. First, the changing marketplace and shifts in how customers use the mail, in, particularly, in particular, declining first-class mail volume and increasing standard mail volume. Second, the changing role of mailers, as driven by work-sharing discounts, which involve mailers preparing, sorting, or transporting mail to qualify for reduced postage rates. These activities allow mail to bypass mail processing and transportation operations. Third, evolutionary changes have resulted in a network of plants that are markedly different from one another and making it difficult to standardize operations. And finally, shifts in national demographics. Service facilities may not be optimally located due to changing demographics and transportation modes. Turning now to our concerns about the service's realignment efforts, our 2005 report concluded that, that the service did not have answers to important questions about how it intended to realign its mail processing networks. This conclusion still holds true today. We found that the service's strategy for realizing, realigning its processing network, first, lacked clarity, criteria, and processes for eliminating excess capacity in its network. Second, largely excluded stakeholder input from its decision-making processes. Third, was not sufficiently transparent and accountable, and fourth, lack performance measures. Mr. Chairman, I want to emphasize that we support the service's efforts to realign its processing networks, but we do have some concerns. The service has started to implement several network realignment initiatives, although overall progress has been somewhat slow. These initiatives include area mail processing, or AMP, consolidations, development of a network of regional distribution centers, and creation of service transportation centers. The realignment efforts are at different stages of implementation. For example, in February of 2006, the service said that it was planning to develop a network of between 28 and 100 regional distribution centers that would serve as the foundation for its processing network. However, the service is apparently reconsidering this approach and Tuesday issued a request for information 
regarding hiring private suppliers to handle some or all business mail. At this point, it is not clear how these various initiatives are integrated or whether they are meeting the realignment goals. A&P consolidations focus on moving processing activities from one plant to another to achieve efficiencies. Our report raises several issues related to these consolidations. Concerns raised by us and others include the service's unclear criteria for selecting facilities and deciding on A&P consolidations, use of inconsistent data calculations, limited measures of the effect of changes on delivery performance, and lack of clarity regarding how stakeholder and public input is solicited and used. It is important to note that the service is revising its guidelines for A&P consolidations to address these issues. After reviewing a draft of these changes, we made two recommendations. First, that the service ensure that the facilities plan required by the Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act explains the integration of realignment initiatives and establishes measurable targets. And second, that the service continue to improve the quality of public notices and engagement and increase transparency in decision making. We reported last year on the service's limited progress in measuring and reporting on its delivery performance. The report detailed the limited scope of the service's delivery measures, which covered less than one-fifth of mail volume. We also covered the need to update delivery standards to reflect current operations, particularly for standard mail and periodicals. We reported on impediments to progress and recommended that the service pro uh, provide clear management commitment and more effective collaboration with mailers to implement delivery measurement and, perform and reporting for all major types of mail. In conclusion, the Postal Reform Law offers the service opportunities to respond to our recommendations from all these reports. It requires the service to submit a plan to Congress describing a strategy, criteria, and processes for realigning its network. Also, the service must develop modern service standards and annually report to the PRC on the speed and reliability of delivery of most types of mail. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my statement. I'm happy to answer any questions the subcommittee may have. To Mr. Milva. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, I appreciate the opportunity to discuss the Postal Service's network and its recent realignment efforts. Our, I will also address our work in this important area and some of the challenges remaining. We described the Postal Service's network in detail in our testimony submitted for the record, and an overview diagram is attached. As you know, the Postal Service has one of the world's largest distribution networks, built on the premise that first-class mail volume and revenue will continually rise and cover costs. However, in recent years, single-piece first-class mail volume has decreased substantially. In addition, the increasing automation of formerly manual processes and work-sharing discounts that keep mail out of parts of the processing stream have left the Postal Service network oversized. In 2001, GAO placed the Postal Service on its high-risk list, and Congress asked for a plan to address GAO's concerns. In response, the Postal Service's 2002 transformation plan included a redesign of its logistics networks called Network Integration and Alignment, or NIA. Our NIA reviews identified the potential for stakeholder concerns about the fairness and accuracy of the process and the need for policies and procedures for independent verification and validation of the project models. In September 2004, the Postal Service announced the Evolutionary Network Development, or END, initiative as the next step in optimizing its networks. The Postmaster General indicated the change to END was made because of the unpredictability of mail volume and processing. A key feature of implementing END is the Area Mail Processing, or AMP, study, which is used to consolidate mail processing functions, eliminate excess capacity, and increase efficiency. Our end concerns have centered on the need for more effective resolution of stakeholder issues for both a top-down and bottom-up approach in using AMPs and for better project management. In reviewing some of the AMPs, we found their conclusions adequately supported, but we reported concerns such as data problems and incomplete service impact documentation. The Postal Service is currently implementing our recommendations to improve the AMP process. Most recently, in October 2006, Postal Service Management announced a reexamination of the assumptions behind the END initiative. This was followed closely by passage of the Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act, which requires a realignment plan by June 2008. Planning for large-scale projects can vary from long-range detailed plans with elaborately sequenced steps 
to short-range incremental approaches. Each has its merits, and the Postal Service has chosen the incremental approach, which provides fle network flexibility as circumstances change, reduces risks inherent in attempting to make all network changes at once, allows testing via pilot projects in a more forgiving environment, generates incremental internal capital to cover the cost, and tends to make the overall picture clearer as local problems are resolved. In recent years, this incremental approach has allowed the Postal Service to make progress in optimizing its network. For example, it has eliminated over 180 million work hours and converted over 30 facilities to a new infrastructure. This approach has also highlighted many significant challenges still being faced in realigning the network. For example, not all postal stakeholders share the same goals, as found in such fundamental issues as providing universal six-day service, which may not make economic sense in all locations, and eliminating mail acceptance points, which would streamline the network and save costs, but often produces mail or opposition. The mix of volume and types of mail is constantly changing. Relationships with mailers are continuously evolving in regards to discounts and mail preparation and submission requirements. And the velocity of the build down must avoid protracted anemic staffing of an oversized network, which can lead to operational and service failures. The Act does not specify a planning model, and the Postal Service believes it is well served by using an order of battle approach that incorporates flexibility and expects external change to occur throughout the process. The Postal Service network must reach an optimal size that still provides enterprise resilience in the event of major disruptions, natural disasters, or acts of terrorism. Fur further, robust measurement is needed to monitor cost and service impacts as the plan unfolds. Finally, the plan must be effectively communicated to all stakeholders to prevent surprises and a negative impact on customer service. The support of Congress and the Postal Regulatory Commission is critical during this time of great change in order for the Postal Service to continue providing universal service at affordable prices. We will continue to support postal efforts, and we are cognizant of our responsibility to keep Congress fully and currently informed. I will be pleased to answer any questions. Thank you both very much. Um, perhaps I'll begin uh, questions, and I'll begin with you, Mr. Milborn. You just indicated that um, the Postal Service's network should be resilient to such things as natural disasters or acts of terrorism. Could you enhance that for us? Uh, Absolutely. There's, there are really two. Um, what I would consider main considerations when, when we think about enterprise resilience with the Postal Service's network. One uh, involves what you just alluded to, uh, localized or regional catastrophes of one kind or another, such as Hurricane Katrina or the anthrax, anthrax attacks that occurred here in the Washington area a few years back. But there are also um, regular significant events that, that affect the whole country. And, and what I mean by that is, is what we call the annual Christmas surge that occurs in November and December. Um, this is one area that requires some degree of, of resilience in the network. Um, the other is being able to resume processing and delivery uh, in the event of a catastrophe such as a Hurricane Katrina that puts some facilities or post offices temporarily out of operation. The Postal Service uh, has capacity in its network right now to handle these types of events. The challenge, as we see it, is that as they begin to streamline the network, can they continue to, to build in some resilience to handle uh, the Christmas surge and to, to be prepared for catastrophes such as these? And we think it's going to be very difficult to, to find the right balance between the cost that would be involved with that and the actual risk uh, of a disruptive event. So are you suggesting in terms of planning that um, the service might um, put additional emphasis or more emphasis on planning for, for these likelihoods? Absolutely. These need to be carefully considered. The, the likelihood of the risk, which in the case of the annual Christmas surge is, 
is 100%. The likelihood of a Katrina is far less than that, but the impact of a Katrina in a local area is very significant. So there are ways to address those risks. It doesn't mean you have to build a network that's constantly large and can handle them, but you need to think about ways of sharing the risk, um, tying in with other networks that may be of assistance if something like that occurs. It just needs to be carefully thought out and planned for. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Cigarant, in the uh, GAO report that you released today, uh, GAO recommended that the Postal Service enhance the planning accountability and public communications related to its realignment efforts. How did the service respond to, to that recommendation? Yes, we made observations in several different areas. And let me start with the AMP consolidations themselves. I said in my short statement that we had some concerns about the data analysis and criteria used in that process. Uh, because the Postal Service is in uh, the midst of revising those guidelines in ways that seem uh, largely responsive to concerns raised by us, the IG, and the, the PRC as well, we didn't make specific recommendations there. Where we did make recommendations was in the com communication side of the House. Uh, in particular, we have concerns about um, the content of some of the, of the material that goes out to explain what is being studied and what actions might be taken. We thought those could be clarified and simplified in a number of ways. The Postal Service did agree with that. Uh, we also were concerned about this event called the Town Hall Meeting and its timing with regard to when it could uh, best bring useful information to bear on the AMP consolidations. The Postal Service also agreed that there would be some benefit to moving that town hall meeting earlier uh, in the process. Finally, the Postal Service uh, did not have, uh, at the time we were doing our work, any indication in its, uh, in its guidelines how it would actually use this information that it obtained from the public through the town hall meeting or other sources. It has also agreed to clarify that. And then finally, with regard to talking about integration and planning, we view the report that's due next June as the Postal Service's uh, opportunity to respond to and explain what it plans to do in a number of areas having to do with realigning the network. In 2006, uh, GAO reported that the Postal Service did not measure and report its delivery performance for most types of mail and that its progress to improve delivery performance information has been slow and inadequate. Has the Postal Service made uh, progress in, in measuring and reporting delivery performance since that time? Yes, we have seen some progress, uh, mainly in uh, planning and thinking about how it is that it will accomplish those activities that you just mentioned. Uh, because the Postal Accountability Enhancement Act called for the development of modern service standards and for information about that to be reported to Congress this December, the Postal Service has put together a series of work groups uh, that are in fact making progress on um, those issues and we have been observing those activities and it looks like there are a lot of ideas out on the table and that this report that's coming out this December uh, is promising in terms of its responsiveness to the issue on the standards. With regard to measurement, there's two activities going on. The, the Postal Service will be required to report to the Postal Regulatory Commission on its delivery performance. It will take some time before the information that is needed will be available on a large scale basis to deliver on that. So there need to be some decisions made about whether there will be sort of interim measures used before uh, the concept of intelligent mail provides more widespread and reliable information. In addition, of course, the Postal Regulatory Commission is setting up its own regulations about what would, uh, what would constitute the best type of information in terms of delivery performance. There's been a lot of activity on that front as well in terms of, that, of comments provided to the Regulatory Commission from mailers and other stakeholders. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Marchant. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Uh, is it Sigurud? Am I saying that right? Thank you. Uh, your report in 2005 and 2007 concluded that the Postal Service is not sufficiently transparent and accountable on how it intends to realign uh, 
it's processing that we're transparent and accountable to, to who? Well, I would say, uh, of course, to the Congress itself, which has an interest in this area, to uh, the public and as well to the, the mailing industry, which relies on the Postal Service uh, for um, an important part of the economy. So uh, what we're really saying here is that when, it, when there's a transformation effort of some kind, which is really what this is, that the concept of transparency, and we've also said this in other areas, of course, uh, transparency is really what are we trying to accomplish, what are our views on how we're going to get there. Uh, and then accountability is really then how do we know when we get there, how are we going to measure our performance. There are um, a variety of ways to accomplish this, this type of effort. The Postal Service is making progress on those concepts with regard to some of these individual efforts that I talked about. Uh, the the, the uh, plan as a whole, though, is still uh, somewhat in development and lacking in a few of those areas. And do you think that the, that the fact that the major element uh, the 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 uh, labor negotiations and the contract with the letter carriers. Do you think it's possible for the post office to make those final changes and those final plans and make them available until they finalize those negotiations and know what their workforce costs are going to be, etc. Well, yes, we think it is. Um, you know, clearly, the the, co the the labor issue and the cost associated with labor is very important in planning. But uh, really, a lot of what we're talking about here, of course, is also the network itself and the fixed costs associated with that. Um, we have seen um, a fair amount of progress in certain areas of this network planning. What we haven't seen is an integration of what the vision is and, and how we're going to get there. I understand that the Postal Service faces a very substantial challenge in this area, but it's been clear from the transformation plan the Postal Service put out itself, the President's Commission, and from the direction from uh, the, the uh, Reform Act in December, that there is a very strong uh, interest in making progress and having some of the transparency and accountability that we've been talking about. Uh, what would you consider to be the most, uh, your most important concern over the Post Office in their realignment? In the realignment area. Well, I think what we would like to see is um, some clear goals set for this realignment effort in terms of time frames, in terms of costs to be achieved, for example, and that if a plan could be put together, some, some vision perhaps even for segments of the realignment that we're talking about so that uh, the mailing industry, the public, and the Congress have some sense of what to inspect, that would be, in our view, very good progress. Uh, Mr. Milburn, uh, what do you see as the biggest uh, network realignment challenge? Well, I agree with uh, Ms. Sigurud that the one she just cited is, is enormous. I, I would add to that by saying I think the, the ability of the Postal Service to, to reduce its costs substantially um, while still delivering service equal to, if not better than, the service that it currently delivers is an enormous challenge. Um, and, and that <coughs> incorporates streamlining of the network, but you alluded to the workforce and, and union negotiations. It, it kind of goes beyond that. But I think the streamlining of the network is a huge piece of that and how they're able to um, ac plan for and accomplish a massive streamlining focused on costs and still be able to focus on and deliver the service at the same time is a real challenge. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Norton. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate this testimony. Um, I'm interested in, a <laughs> in an overarching, I think, obvious question that in light of the fact that the post office is here, uh, we in Congress are quite pleased to look past, uh, and that is whether essentially this model gives the Postal Service today a mission impossible. First of all, we're dealing with a model that we enacted, we passed in 1970, and of course we've updated the act most recently, and, and very recently have up updated it. Um, but I, I have trouble finding <laughs> any precedent for the model we, we, we're dealing with. Um, um, and I'm very interested in your ideas on planning. Um, I'd like to know if you can think of any comparable 
model that, for example, <coughs> presents the kind of issues that have come before us. Uh, these, uh, the Postal Service has been told to meet um, the same conditions uh, that private mailers meet. It's told them to do that in 1970. Think of what 1970 was. It was pre-technology. No one even envisioned that there would be a faster, cheaper way to communicate. Um, um, if you decide to cut out even one post office someplace, it's a major issue in that community, and members of Congress will come, will join the community in saying you better not do it. And yet the Postal Service has had some success <laughs> in fighting through that, and we think they, they will perhaps have more success, but, but nevertheless, t as an example, uh, if anything, that's a, that's a 18, 19th century model, 18th century model. Much of the Postal Service still is a, a model from this original act passed setting up this will be a post office in the United States of America. Had a major controversy came before this committee on outsourcing. Major issue because um, postal uh, workers uh, for reasons that range from security reasons to their own employment object to what looks like creeping outsourcing. And, and private mailers don't have that problem. Uh, even the Congress will take on the Postal Service on, <laughs> on something that it recognizes that half the time across party lines, we don't even recognize the model. I recall a few years ago when the Postal Service um, uh, did what every uh, big private corporation does and got sponsorship of the Olympics. And so it was the Postal Service uh, logo. And so members of Congress, I'm telling you, Republicans as well as Democrats came forward and said, what in the world are you doing sponsoring the Olympics? You know, gone from everybody's uh, brain uh, was the notion that this is what private corporations do and they don't do it uh, on a whim, they do market surveys. Um, we talk about major disruptions. Well, you know, private companies will go down the drain. We've had a major disruption, the worst kind here. Um, Everybody has to prepare for that. They've got to prepare for it in a very special way because nobody will accept we've had a major disruption, therefore we can't deliver the mail. Um, the uh, delivery times, each member will hold the Postal Service accountable for delivery times within its jurisdiction as a major problem here even in the nation's capital of several and this region a number of years ago and they, they, they had to get their, their ducks in a row um, we talk about stakeholder input. There's a lot to be said to that. The more you get of that, of course, the more demands <laughs> there are going to be on the Postal Service of the kind that everybody's grandmama made, you know. <laughs> gotta have Saturday delivery. Uh, gotta have what we have always had. Uh, and finally, of course, I've mentioned the granddaddy of them all, uh, whether you will think that the Postal Service is just a complete and total anachronism based on technological changes and generation that increasingly doesn't even use newspapers and other normal, <laughs> normal contraptions of modern society but depends on technology. Uh, so I am interested in overriding the issue that, um, uh, that uh, one, if whether there's any model like this in the world uh, and whether you think planning will overcome all of these obstacles. If I can name the closest model I can think of, it's one that the Congress has completely rejected. And that is why we have a, uh, a railroad system that harks back to the 19th century. Every modern society says if you want to have a railroad system and you've got to have one and you want to have passengers, then you've got to massively subsidize it. Well, the United States says, hey, we're not going to subsidize Amtrak or anything else. You're on your own, and by the way, keep them running and, and modernize the thing. So you know, we just we just look away from the obvious issues. Well, you can do that on Amtrak, and you'll end up with what we have today. And you know, people get on planes, buses, or whatever. You, on the Postal Service, the Congress won't tolerate it. At the same time, the Congress is saying you do the same thing UPS does, <laughs> you need to do the same thing FedEx does. You do it without one cent from us. And you know, I for one find all this very intriguing, structurally and intellectually. But I need to hear from experts whether you think this is a model that can survive the ages. 
Ms. Horton, uh, those were a lot of questions. I'll, I'll, I'll answer what I can. I, I have to say that I think your observations I'm are- not, It really is one question. I okay. just gave you examples All right. of, mm -hmm. of what I think mm -hmm. Congress just okay. looks past and says, y'all do it anyway. Don't tell us, just do mm -hmm. it. I, I think your, your summary of the challenge was right on. That is that the, uh, the Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act said the Postal Service, uh, and in fact, that hearkening back to 1970, the Postal Service should act as a business. Uh, this most recent act said that postage rates need to be held, of course, to the rate of inflation. Uh, but many stakeholders, including the Congress, have taken off the table a number of cost control options that the Postal Service uh, could use to respond to that rate cap that, that you that you mentioned. And you can depend on us not to put them back on the table. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I guess I want to focus on the issue of is, is there another model out there like that? Clearly, the Postal Service is the biggest uh, uh, post in, in the world and, and, and uh, handles a, a larger volume than, than the other, in any other country. Um, <clears throat> but I want to focus on my, my comments on this concept of the network that we've been talking about and the costs associated with that. The closest model that we have in the United States to the challenges of right-sizing that network are really uh, the BRAC uh, approach. Uh, where there is some excess capacity, uh, stakeholders who want a variety of, of different things and a need uh, to cut costs. The, to the extent that that uh, has been a successful approach, and, and there are differing uh, views on that, um, there are a, a couple of, of things that have been key to that. One is that the BRAC process set out principles. Uh, what, what are we trying to accomplish? Uh, what tools do we have? It, 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 it named the people that would be important for making those decisions, and then it laid out a process for making decisions. Uh, whether that is useful in thinking about uh, the, uh, the cost the Postal Service faces um, may be worth considering. By the way, that's a, this is a very intriguing and interesting thing. Given the, ex given the experience with, with BRAC, one wonders what what, what, how far down the Postal Service would have to get before Congress politically embraced that model. But it's a very interesting and uh, intriguing <laughs> notion. Yes, Mr. Milborn. I've, I've seen a couple different models, one very close over a, a fairly extended period of time and the other just from some reading and research, but they both offer some lessons learned, I think. One is the Internal Revenue Service. Um, I spent a fair amount of my career there and, and uh, both started there and then came back to it after the Reorganization Act of 1998. And they had a, had a modernization program and a restructuring program that was on two different levels. One was to go from a regionally based structure to uh, a taxpayer type or a customer type driven structure. That was a, actually a fairly easy thing to do. Commissioner Rosati took that bull by the horns and, and did a very remarkable job of reori reorienting the people of the IRS and the structure and some of the processes. The very difficult part that they've been struggling with since I first worked there uh, in the early 80s is the issue of modernizing their computer systems. They have been attempting to modernize their archaic master file for 20 some years now and, and are, are not dramatically close to finishing it. And they have had a series of, of very extensive plans, uh, but as, they as the plan unfolds and time passes, technology changes, the world changes around them, much as you were saying, and, and so the, the plan has had to change and evolve over time. They've had to basically retrench along the way. I think that's a key lesson learned. Uh, if you're having a long-term restructuring that, that you need to be flexible enough to be able to account for changes in the environment and new things that come at you over time. The other model, and this is one I'm far less familiar with, but some of the European Post, uh, Deutsche Post, for example, it's my understanding when they embarked on a modernization project, and admittedly it's dramatically smaller than what we're talking about here, um, they elected to do what amounted to shock therapy. They, they just redid everything at once, redid their processing, redid their equipment. Um, that's, that's my understanding of it. I don't see that the Postal Service could do something like that because of the enormous cost involved. Um, but 
there certainly are some lessons learned, good, bad, and indifferent, from taking that kind of approach. Thank you very much, Mr. Milborn. We will go to Mr. McHugh. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Uh, welcome. Uh, by way of editorial comment, I, I, I would say uh, how much I know we all appreciate the continued efforts of both the GAO and the Inspection, Serv uh, Inspection General, Inspector General. Um, over my now, I guess, 14 years of involvement in these issues, we've called upon GAO repeatedly to, uh, to guide us and to assist us. This is the latest initiative, and, and we're always uh, not just very happy, but uh, very much in need of your, your help, and, and we appreciate that. And as someone who had a little something to do with the creation of an independent inspector office, uh, a few bumps and grinds aside, I, I think this is, uh, it was a wise decision, and we're seeing a little bit of that today. Uh, Mr. Milborn, I, I hope I didn't bob my head too hard in agreement as you were talking about what perhaps is one of the most profound and yet in its structure one of the most simple challenges the Postal Service faces, that is to cut costs, but to do it in a way that hopefully enhances services. And yet as I look through the GAO report, one of the uh, more striking statements I saw, and probably because it was bold headline, but it's also in the, in the text that UPS does not have a mechanism for determining uh, AMP consolidation impacts on delivery of performance. I'm a little, and then they go on to talk about there are some proxies, uh, but proxies are not direct performance standards. How do we, help the Postal Service to develop that kind of process. How can you really, this is the, the second question, it's more rhetorical, how can you really go through a very necessary and yet uh, critically dangerous process like the AMP without having some kind of performance standard measurement? You got any answers to that or suggestions, either one of you? I do think it has to be something on a global scale. In other words, I, I don't think that um, the Postal Service can approach individual AMPs from the standpoint of trying to set performance or, or service standards for that individual consolidation. I, to me, I tie this back to the requirements of the new act that says they have to do this kind of thing globally for the different categories of mail. Um, once they've got that, then they have the criteria to use with each individual AMP. What, what we've been finding in our reviews with the AMPs is simply the fact that they have to uh, be very cognizant of and analyze what are the expected changes when they make a consolidation to the standards that they already have and ideally to future ones as they become established. Um, and, and that needs to be a critical part of the decision making on whether in fact to consolidate under any given AMP. Ms. Sigurd? Any, any thoughts? What I, I, I would what agree wholeheartedly with what Mr. Milborn said. I think constructing some sort of delivery performance measurement approach uh, AMP by AMP would be uh, not a good use of the Postal Service's resources and probably not possible. We do need to look to this time down the road when the reporting standards and the new technology will make such type of measurement available. So we can, I think, all agree it needs to be system-wide, and yet we don't really have the answers at the moment as to what those are. This is a work in progress, but, it, but I, and I hope the Postal Service agrees, this, it's a work that's got to be completed if you're going to have an efficient e evolution to a, to a new model and one that enhances uh, delivery performance, yes? Yes. Uh, boy, was that, really, that was four minutes, huh? Mr. Milborn. You, you talked about probably one of the best ways to deconflict the process, and, and the gentlelady from the, the District of Columbia was talking about some of the challenges of, of having Congress involved, but probably the best thing we could do is tell Congress you can't contact the Postal Service, and particularly in AMPs. I just had two go through it, and I'll tell you I wrote a few letters, and I'm sure we all did. But you talk in your, your, your uh, testimony about reconciling what you define to be the sometimes conflicting message, this is a very gentlemanly way of putting it, sometimes conflicting messages from influential stakeholders and mitigate their risk where possible to preclude paralyzing inaction. 
boy, how can we do that? Because that, yeah. that's a hard one. Th this is going to be really tough because there are so many important stakeholders out there. There's, there's of course, Congress, but there are also mailers. And you and me receiving mail at our house are, are an important stakeholder. Um, I think the Postal Service needs to reach out very broadly to all possible groups to solicit this kind of input in, in an attempt to resolve these kind of conflicting uh, of views. The question I think that will remain is, is it within the Postal Service's authority to elect to resolve some of these on its own? Or, or will it be directed to do certain things irrespective of what seems to be the best business decision to make uh, with all of the necessary input. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I should have left him alone. He wasn't paying attention to the clock. May, if I may, with your forbearance, just one, what I hope will be a quick question. Uh, uh, Ms. Sigurd, you, you, you spoke about, and, and of course the topic here today is, is the mandate for modernizing service standards and measures. You talked about the PRC involving itself in, in their necessary work of developing regulations. I'm just curious, uh, did you have a chance to, to assess the, the PRC's efforts there? Is that progressing in a, in a, in a, six, in a sufficient manner, do you think? We have not assessed the PRC's efforts in this area at this time. Mr. Sigurd, I don't, I don't expect Mr. Milborn, you have an opinion on that, do No, you? sir. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I told you to be brief. Thank you both very much. Uh, we may have some additional questions that we'd like to submit to you in writing, but uh, given the fact that we've got uh, three panels, we will proceed, and thank you very much for your testimony. While we're getting ready to seat panel two, let me just acknowledge that uh, we're always pleased to have present uh, former members of Congress who have deliberated long and hard on these issues. And I see that former Representative William Clay is present, sir, and we're delighted that you're here. Thank you. While we're being seated, I will go ahead and introduce the witnesses. Panel two is Dr. John Waller, who has been director of the Office of Rates Analysis and Planning of the Postal Regulatory Commission since February of 2005. His primary responsibilities are directing the technical advisory staff of the commission in supporting the commissioners in all proceedings and the development of commission reports. Mr. William P. Galligan was named Senior Vice President for Operations in May of 2005 and reports to the Deputy Postmaster General and Chief Operating Officer. Mr. Galligan has responsibility for the Postal Service's engineering facilities network operations management, and delivery and retail functions. Gentlemen, we welcome you both and thank you very much. And if you would stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that your testimony is the truth and the whole truth and nothing but the truth? The record will show that each one of the witnesses answered in the affirmative and we will begin with uh, Dr. Waller. You may want to pull it just a little closer. It says it's on there. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. My remarks are based on the Commission's 2006 proceeding on the evolutionary network development plans of the Postal Service. A copy of the Commission's opinion is attached to my full written statement. 
The Commission endorses the service's goals to create a more efficient and flexible postal network that realizes cost savings while maintaining service standards. The Commission also recognizes both the value of using modern computerized optimization and simulation techniques to identify mail processing facilities for consolidation and the need to conduct site-specific reviews of individual facility consolidation plans as a reality check on the outputs of the computer models. However, the Commission's analysis identifies significant problems that could result in a less efficient network with slower services. For instance, the emphasis on consolidating operations from smaller plants into larger ones rather than consolidating from less productive plants into more productive ones. Focusing on productivity holds more promise. Transportation was not adequately considered in the uh, end plans. It was not clear how nationwide transportation would be realigned since the backbone of the network, the regional distribution centers, is shrouded in uncertainty. The Postal Service estimated there could be anywhere from 28 to 100 such centers. At the local level, only six of the 17 of the consolidation plans reviewed by the Commission revealed estimated transportation cost savings. As of last year, network development plans did not consider the significant changes in mail processing and transportation that will occur with the introduction of the flight flats sequencing machines. These machines are huge, expensive, and were not incorporated in the planning models. The Postal Service recognizes that its network redesign program could have a significant impact on service. However, in the proceeding, it did not provide a reliable estimate of the volume of mail that would experience either a downgrade or an upgrade in days to delivery. Nor did it estimate how often the Postal Service would need to move up collection times from the blue boxes or require earlier dro bulk drop-offs at their plants in order to meet performance standards. Nor did it provide information on the impact consolidations might have on time of delivery during an individual day to the homes and businesses. The Commission also found problems and faulty assumptions in the computer models, in particular not using actual mail processing productivity and cost characteristics. Instead, the models assumed idealized operations that ignore currently wide disparities in, disparities in productivity among plants. There is also assuming that unit costs decrease as plant sizes increase, and this conflicts with evidence presented to the Commission. The site-specific development evaluation problems included lack of consistency in review procedures, lack of criteria for approval or disapproval of proposed consolidation, lack of public and mailer input, and a severe tardiness in errors in analysis in the post-consolidation reviews where the, the Postal Service would learn as it goes forward. While changes have been made and were made during the time of the proceeding, it is questionable if flaws have been remedied, particularly given the GAO report that has just been released. In closing, let me emphasize that the Commission believes that the Postal Service should have the flexibility and authority to adjust its operations and networks to meet its business needs and create cost savings and efficiencies. However, the Postal Service must be accountable and transparent to all postal customers and be sensitive to the needs of the communities it serves. Thank you. I'll be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Dr. Waller. Uh, Mr. Galligan. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Marchant, and members of the subcommittee. I'm pleased to be with you today. As Senior Vice President of Operations for the Postal Service, I am responsible for engineering, facilities, delivery, and retail operations, and most relevant to our discussion today, network operations. There is a close and interdependent relationship amongst these activities. They have a strong influence on the viability of our network. 
Ultimately, our service standards and ability to meet them are based on the effectiveness of the network. I look forward to discussing both of these important issues with you. It is important that we view them within the context of the Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act, which was enacted last December. The law resulted in major changes that affect not only the Postal Service, but the entire mailing industry. One of the most significant changes is the requirement that price adjustments for our market dominant products cannot exceed annual growth in the consumer price index. These products represent 90% of our business. Unfortunately, some key cost drivers such as energy and health care benefits regularly exceed CPI growth. With this requirement, the challenge for the Postal Service is to reduce costs and increase productivity while providing high quality, affordable, universal service to our nation. One approach we are pursuing is the examination of our processing and distribution and transportation network. Today's network is a product of an evolutionary process that began when our system was created over 230 years ago. It expanded to serve a nation that was growing in population and territory. This infrastructure was adjusted over time to accommodate steadily growing mail volumes, the latest trends in transportation technology, and specialized facilities to achieve greater efficiency. In 1970, more than 2,000 facilities performed outgoing mail processing. Today, the number is less than 400. But in view of changes in mail volume and the types of mail entering our system, we must continue to make our network even more efficient and capable of satisfying our customers' needs. Since 1998, single piece first class volume has declined by almost 14 billion pieces, or 25%. This erosion continues by 1.5 billion pieces each year. Without offsetting system adjustments, this volume erosion reduces network efficiency and negatively affects our bottom line. We have also seen a growing shift to pre-sort mail, which enters our system much closer to its final delivery point. In 1970, virtually all mail moved end-to-end -end through our system. Today, about 40% of the mail we handle no longer requires end-to-end -end transportation. This decline in single-piece first-class mail and the entry of more mail deeper into our system means that our network is not aligned with current and future needs. Excess mail processing and transportation capacity drives up unnecessary costs and challenges our ability to operate within the statutory limits of a rate cap. As Postmaster General Potter testified here last week, our challenge is to close the gap between prices and costs while maintaining quality service. He explained that management could proceed along any of three paths. The first is continuing status quo, which is obviously unacceptable. The second path is extensive contracting out of work now performed by our employees. But this could undermine labor management and employee relationships that are so important to contributing the excellent service we provide our customers every day. We prefer a third path, working cooperatively with our stakeholders to confront the cr critical issues we are facing as an organization and as an industry. The continuing modification of our network to reduce duplication, increase efficiency, accommodate new equipment, and meet changing needs of our mailers is a strategy we are we have pursuing along this path. Network adjustments have contributed to our ability to achieve record levels of service, customer satisfaction, and unprecedented levels of productivity. Based on more recent stakeholder input, we have been working to improve our business processes related to impl implementing network changes. These include expanded public notice, expanded public input, and increased transparency. Through all of these changes, we remain committed to our customers by maintaining overall surface service responsiveness and to our employees by not laying off a single career postal employee. The new postal law also requires us to develop modern service standards and related measurement systems. Together with a large and diverse group that represents all elements of the mail, mailing community, we are working to identify what changes may be warranted. We are on target to complete this process next month. We are already consulting with the Postal Regulatory Commission so that new service standards can be published by late December. In developing measurement systems, we are exploring the possible use of our intelligent mail barcode as part of an information platform 
that will allow us to leverage internal passive data collection to efficiently measure actual service performance. We look forward to working with our stakeholders, particularly the Postal Regulatory Commission, Commission in achieving agreement on revised service standards and measurement systems. I appreciate having the opportunity to discuss these important issues with you today, and I would be pleased to respond to any questions you may have. Thank you, gentlemen, both very much. Uh, Mr. Galligan, I think you present a, a rather comprehensive look at some of the problems and difficulties which the service is facing, especially when you talk about the decline in, in first class mail and decline in the number of pieces of mail that there is to be delivered. Given these difficulties or given these realities, redesigning and streamlining the postal in infrastructure has been under consideration for quite some time. When you consider service to customers, the needs of mailers, the future impact of automation, and the entire environment in which you, you're working, what do you envision the new network looking like? And, and when would you see it sort of coming online in terms of saying, here's what we think it's really going to have to be? Mr. Chairman, I, I think that in much of the discourse around this subject, um, we have to look at it from two different points of view. Um, our core competence, competency as an organization is our network of delivery and retail facilities. That intact is, is a fundamental strength of our organization. Our processing and distribution centers that are uh, world class with letter and flat automation, and we are adding to that flat automation base as we move forward with the flat sequencing system, form the backbone of our future network. Um, we also have an excellent air strategy that's part of that network that uh, moves mail in the air via two uh, very competent suppliers and a select uh, number of uh, commercial airlines. Uh, and where we are right now that I know it's been called unclear, but it is in fact part of uh, a business concept that we are working through is what do we do with our long haul ground network and what has been called our bulk mail center network. And we are working through uh, market research on that effort, and certainly we intend to uh, be uh, out with our facilities plan in accordance with the, uh, the new law by June of next year. So uh, my vision of the future at this point in time is we are certain that the erosion of first class mail continues. Uh, the consolidation of outgoing facilities continues on a very evolutionary scale. Uh, our air network strategy is very clear the uh, work we are doing right now uh, that will bring certainty to uh, our total ground network and our bulk mail center network is uh, still to be determined. It's a work in progress. You gave uh, great credence to the relationships between all components of the system, that is management and labor working cooperatively together. Uh, what mechanisms do you have in place to solicit input from the unions and, and management associations relative to planning the new system or the new design? Well, we, fu we fully intend as we move through uh, examination of any business process to communicate to our impacted organization, union organizations, what it is we are looking to research and and how that would play out. We have already been in communi communications, I personally, with, with leadership around where we are with our business concepts. Uh, these are not plans, these are not decisions. These are uh, uh, essentially uh, steps forward for us to build a business case that will ultimately bring to, uh, to fruition a full-scale facilities network plan for the U.S. Postal Service. And uh, I look forward to working with uh, the leadership of all impacted uh, labor organizations to be very upfront in that regard. Um, Dr. Walla, what, what are the PRC's 
views on the Postal Service's strategy for realignment that you've heard up to this point? Um, how do you respond to what you've heard? Well, the a lot of what we've heard is still similar to what was there uh, last year. It isn't that much time has gone by, so a lot of the reactions are the same that are in the uh, report. Um, it has just been pointed out that the, uh, particularly the big hole is the BMC network and what's the strategy going to be there for that. And uh, I think new initiatives are being pursued by the uh, Postal Service from what was just said to try and firm that up. And I think that's a uh, useful, a useful move because you can't, unless you know what the backbone of the major transportation system is going to be, it's hard to adjust and say anything more than we said before. I think some of the criticisms still hold. Uh, I don't know to the extent that they're going to revise their use of the models that were part of the uh, END process, uh, but to the extent there they do need some uh, revisions to put in uh, inputs that reflect more reality of what's going on uh, out there in the field right now. There is a great diversity in the performance among the plants and until and that comes before the commission a lot of times there's no explanation of why that diversity exists. Uh, it's just said to be fixed and persistent over time and until some of those are understood better it's going to be hard to understand how they're going to affect that uh, uh, ending up with a more productive network. Uh, hopefully that will be taken care of too and they will be have more realistic models if they continue to use that approach. Thank you, gentlemen, very much. Uh, Mr. Marchant. Uh, Mr. Waller, uh, you said in the last part of your testimony that uh, the PRC has brought transparency to the postal network development plans, but the previous panel specifically said that that was not the case. Uh, I think it's where we were when we started the case to where we were when we ended the case. Uh, when the case started and it took a great deal of that effort on the part of the uh, people asking questions to find out exactly how many of the facilities were under consideration for modification. I think this enlivened the process very much of the review of them that's been going on then across the country right now. Mm -hmm. uh, we, I think through the asking of questions about the AMP process, got much more public input. There was a lot of forces causing that to happen. But as it became apparent as the case started, that very little was out there in the public including just what was the list of candidate facilities that had come out of all this modeling process. I think that helped add transparency. I think the AMP process did improve with more public input, but just identifying that that was a need is, I think, been a value added. So y y you don't view the uh, general accounting office, do you view them as an adversary or Oh no! I someone was that is helping. Oh, I think it's very useful. I think they endorsed and, and reiterated a lot of the conclusions that were in our advisory opinion. I think there's a lot of similarity, and they just picked it up and said, "Yeah, in the few months that have gone by, not that much has changed." When it comes to, uh, I have a bulk mail facility in my district, and uh, uh, when it comes to the bulk mail facilities, is that really a public input? issue or are the retail facilities more of a public in input? Well, I, I think that it's a public, any part of the node that mail is particularly dropped off, there are particular discounts that are for the BMCs and if you close or move them, people that are using them as an input are going to have to adjust where they go and it may be more expensive for them. So in, the, in this case, the public would be the uh, the retailers, the mailers. It, the it would be retailers, it would be the local communities too that would be affected. I think the broader you set a, a net to get ideas, the more better off you're going to be because the more people are going to understand the needs. Uh, so I would say both the la local community, the labor, people who understand the local issues 
but in particular, the mailers that actually use it mm -hmm. uh, have to, uh, I mean, it's been pointed out that the work sharing concept has evolved to a large extent. Well, that's where now the mailers are doing a lot of work previously done by the Postal Service and inserting it deeper into the system. Well, those insertion points are very critical both to the mailer, what kind of service are they going to get at that insertion point, et cetera. And if you start mixing those up, you have to, tr you have to examine the impact it's going to have on that. For instance, I would assume that there are a lot of um, uh, possibly mailers near you, consolidators near your center, who have built infrastructure themselves. So it's not just the Postal Service that would end up changing. There would be changes within the mailers who would use it. And if they can't continue to use it in an efficient way, then the system itself overall is not going to get more efficient. So it has to be considered as not just what's happening to the Postal Service, but what's happening to the people who insert mail into the system and those then how fast it gets to the mailing, uh, the people who are receiving the mail too. Well, and every two years, all of us have the opportunity to uh, get into the bulk mail business, <laughs> and <laughs> uh, especially in media markets like Dallas, where that's the only affordable way to communicate, uh, whether it be campaign or MRA. It's it's uh, so it's a vital interest to all of us. But uh, yes, uh, my district is surrounded in DFW Airport. And uh, so, yes, the uh, bulk mail people have located there, JCPenney, uh, all of the major mailers. So I appreciate your efforts. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. You mean television is too? It's for my district. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't be doing much of that. Um, let me just ask uh, an additional question or so. Um, Mr. Galligan, nobody likes to mention or make reference to, but I, I, I did note that Mr. Milborn, in, in his testimony, did suggest that there might be times when you might have to look at the appropriateness of six-day delivery in some instances or some places. Um, is, is there much thought or conversation given to that kind of, of thinking? Well, I, I know Congresswoman Norton mentioned the mission impossible. I don't share that we are on a mission impossible course, but it is a mission challenged. Um, my personal opinion, and I think it is shared by our Postmaster General, is that the issue of six-day delivery uh, cuts to a public policy debate that goes to the notion of universal service. Um, I can assure you that organizationally in my delivery and retail organization, we are not preoccupied at this point in time with any notion around changing our days of delivery to uh, to a five-day model or an every-other-day model, whether there would be, be a point in time where our cost burden against the uh, top-line revenue is so out of whack that uh, that needs to be considered, I think it's a matter of a public policy debate. I think it would cut through to uh, the very notion of the mail monopoly and universal service. And uh, not to pass a monkey off my back, Mr. Chairman, but I kind of think that issue would probably fall up to your chair. <laughs> well, I, 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 I think it's something that certainly some people give thought and, and consideration to, and I think it's something that we have to be cognizant of, uh, and I, I would agree with your initial assessment that there are no simple solutions to very complex problems and there are complexities which do in fact exist. And I think what we all want to do is to try and make sure that we have a viable postal service that does in fact embody the principles of universal service 
and the principles of work opportunities and all of those things that we've come to know it as being. So let me thank you gentlemen for your testimony and I'm sure we'll be continuing to look at all of that. Let me also just indicate that uh, Congressman Adam Schiff has uh, questions that he'd like to submit as part of the record to the Postal Service for answers and without objection, uh, that will be so ordered. Gentlemen, thank you very thank much. You very we much. appreciate thank you. you being here. While our third panel is being seated, I will go ahead and uh, introduce them. Uh, panel three, Mr. Michael Wynn has served as the Director of Postal Operations for R.R. R. Donnelly, who is a member of the Association for Postal Commerce. Mr. Wynn has been active in many printing industry associations and has been a member of the graphic arts industry for over 30 years. I might also indicate that R.R. R. Donnelly is one of the major business operations in my congressional district, and we are indeed pleased and delighted to have them. Mr. Robert E. McLean has been the executive director of the Mailers Council since 1996. He furnishes management services for the nonprofit advocacy organization, serves as its public spokesman, and represents the council on Capitol Hill. Mr. Jerry uh, Cesarali joined the Direct Marketing Association, DMA, in 1995 as Senior Vice President, Government Affairs. He is in charge of the DMA's contact with Congress, all federal agencies, and state and local governments. And Mr. Timothy May serves as general counsel and postal counsel to mail order companies, mailer associations, publishers, and organizations of postal employees, including the Parcel Shippers Association, the National Association of Postal Supervisors, Netflix, and Capital One. Gentlemen, welcome, and if you would uh, rise and raise your right hand, Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I the do. record will show that each one of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. And welcome, Mr. Wynn, we'll begin with you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, thank you for providing me this opportunity to testify on behalf for the Association for Postal Commerce, also known as POSTCOM. I am a member of POSTCOM's Board of Directors and the Executive Committee of the Board. On behalf of POSTCOM's membership, we appreciate the opportunity you have provided POSTCOM to submit our views on the significant postal issues that you are examining in this hearing. POSTCOM's membership consists of businesses and organizations, large and small, that use the postal system to communicate with their customers, donors, and constituents. POSTCOM membership also includes the printers, logistic companies, fulfillment houses, software providers, and others that make use of the postal system possible. Collectively, our membership is estimated to account for in excess of 70% of all the revenues the Postal Service receives from the standard mail subclasses. But our interest in the postal system goes far beyond these subclasses. It is estimated that postal com, postcom members account for about 50% or more of the total volume of catalogs weighing over one pound, books, audio and video, video materials, and parcels that the Postal Service handles each year. Our membership also makes extensive use of first class mail and of both domestic and international shipments handled by alternative service providers such as UPS, FedEx, and DHL. POSTCOM thus has a vital interest 
in assuring the existence of an efficient, po responsible, financially stable, and competitive postal service. My company, R.R. Donnelly, is the largest printer and postal logistics provider in the United States. As a mail service provider, we work with our customers to prepare enormous amounts of mail in all classes, periodicals, catalogs, parcels, and letter mail. R.R. Donnelly produces a very significant portion of the uh, mail pieces that are processed by the Postal Service and provides logistics for even more. The passage of the Postal Accountability Enhancement Act was a critical step to enable the Postal Service to address the difficult issues that it con confronts in the current market environment. The Postal Service faces the continued expansion of postal delivery points, which increases its costs, and at the same time, a decline in the rate of growth of mail volume, which adversely affects revenues. With the passage of this act, Congress altered the regulatory framework in a comprehensive manner that strengthens regulatory oversight and enhances transparency, while providing the Postal Service the necessary management incentives to meet these challenges through greater operational efficiency and high quality service standards. Postcom supported the passage of the Postal Accountability Act and we are deeply grateful for the hard work that this committee put into that effort. Mr. Chairman, we submitted detailed written testimony, so I will give a summary today. First, on postal realignment or end, uh, evolutionary network uh, development. Uh, Postcom members support the uh, realignment of the network uh, because we need an efficient, cost-effective, method of delivering our message to the consumers. However, there is room for improvement in the way the realignment process is operating, and that's really around communications. Uh, the ultimate objective of the network redesign is to have an efficient network based on the needs of delivery, the new automation that is being deployed to efficiently process the mail, and to <coughs> control costs. However, if it is done without a proper communication plan, which any good business should have, it is going to be incurring costs that are unnecessary. I'll give you an example. Uh, if we do not have a transparent view of how the network is going to be realigned, as logistics providers, we quite often have trucks redirected in transit from one facility to another. Uh, our customers make mail plans to meet in-home dates months, sometimes weeks uh, in advance. So we depend on the communication from the Postal Service as to where we are going and how to most efficiently get it there. Redirections increase costs and possibly even create delays for our customers. Let's talk about another thing under um, the banner of um, network realignment, and that is as the Postal Service is deploying new automation and changing the mail preparation requirements that are, are put on mailers and mail service providers, uh, we have to be careful not to just shift costs out of the Postal Service into the private sector. We look at total system costs to our customers, the mailers, as the correct way to be realigning the network and changing requirements for mail preparation and delivery. A little bit on service standards. Service standards are absolutely vital to the mailers uh, along with good measurement and reporting. The reason is that an entire business decision is based on an in-home date. A mailer needs to know when their message is going to reach the consumer so they can respond accordingly. I'll give you two brief examples. Periodicals. Subscribers buy periodicals because they expect to receive the periodical at a certain time. If that is not maintained, it is very likely that the subscriber will not resubscribe. So the business decision there is how do you produce the periodical? with a dependable service standard and measurement to reach a certain in-home date. Even more challenging is on the side of the catalogs. Catalogs start with an in-home date, and from there they develop their mail plan when they're going to drop the mail. From there they tell their printer when they're going to be able to print. 
then there's a decision on the inventory and the content of that catalog. Coordinating the in-home date with inventory on hand in a staff call center is the challenge. And it all stems from service standards with critical entry times. The critical entry times can uh, also be affected by the automation that is being deployed. And if that changes, we need transparency in seeing how that is going to change so we can adjust our meal plans and other, uh, other planning accordingly. In conclusion, I would like to thank you, Mr. Chairman, and the subcommittee for allowing me to, testimony, to testify today on behalf of POSCOM, and we appreciate your uh, accepting of our written testimony. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. McLean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Marchant, the Mailers Council is the largest group of mailers and mailing associations in the nation. We represent for-profit and non-profit mailers, both large and small, that use the Postal Service to deliver correspondence, publications, parcels, greeting cards, advertisements, and payments. Collectively, the Council accounts for approximately 70 percent of all of the nation's mail. The Mailers Council believes that the Postal Service can be operated more efficiently, supports efforts aimed at containing postal costs, and has the ultimate objective of lower postal rates without compromising service. We welcome this opportunity to testify on the creation of delivery service standards and performance measurement systems. These were issues of singular importance to mailers who lobbied for their inclusion in the Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act, the Postal Reform Bill signed into law last December, and that many people on this day has had something to do with. Whatever differences mailers may have had on other sections of the bill, our members were and are unified in their support for standards and a meaningful performance measurement system. There are several reasons why we're so interested in new delivery standards. For many mail classes, the Postal Service today has delivery guidelines, not standards, and its measurement systems fail to measure the type of mail that comprises most of the volume it delivers. Although Title 39 directs the Postal Service to operate like a business, in this area the Postal Service is doing quite the opposite. Private sector companies would not conceive of functioning without standards for one fundamental reason. Setting standards and measuring the organization's success in achieving them makes the organization better. Only by measuring performance can an organization identify where problems exist and then correct them and reward managers for their improvements. We believe that creating new delivery service standards and performance measurement systems can be done in a way that will satisfy mailers for four reasons. First, because of improvements in the technology found at every mail processing facility, much of the data needed to determine delivery performance already exists. Second, data collection for delivery measurement in classes that affect the largest mailers can be developed without large new expenses. Third, any additional cost would be an insignificant portion of the postal budget. And fourth, mailers will dedicate their time to working with the Postal Service to design these processes because they will help make management more efficient and hold down postage costs. As for the features we expect to see in the new delivery standards, they must be realistic and reliable. The Postal Service must avoid lowering existing service standards. We need new and more complete reporting of delivery performance as well. Mailers are interested in the speed and consistency of delivery, so we need a system that will tell us if the Postal Service is achieving both goals. New delivery performance reports must be timely and detailed by geographic location. The Mailers Council opposes the concept of finding the Postal Service should it fail to meet delivery standards. Because the Postal Service receives 100 percent of its revenue from mailers, the imposition of a fine would actually be a fine on mailers. The Postal Service's Board of Governors must encourage the creation of new executive compensation systems that reflect management's ability to meet those standards. These systems must offer greater compensation where consistent, on-time delivery is met. You also asked us to comment on the closing and consolidating of, post of postal facilities. In its efforts to improve delivery performance and in response to ongoing changes in mail volume and composition, the Postal Service will need to consider consolidating some of its facilities. We will support the Postal Service in realigning its mail processing and delivery networks. We recognize that closing a postal facility is difficult because it affects the lives of so many individuals. However, right-sizing the postal network is an essential step to keeping down the cost of postage. Therefore, we hope members of Congress, including members of this subcommittee, will support such decisions that are essential to improving postal efficiency nationwide. Where consolidations have been handled successfully, postal managers communicated with mailers, employees, and the public served early and often. They also allowed sufficient time to plan delivery and transportation changes. Where such consolidations have been handled poorly, postal managers have moved too quickly, 
and failed to sufficiently discuss the implications with its customers, like Mike, and its employees. The Mailers Council members have spoken with senior postal officials, including Postmaster General Jack Potter, about how network realignment will be handled in the future. As a result, we're confident that mailers will be brought into discussions earlier and that we will be assured that managers in the field will have the resources they need to implement such difficult changes. Mr. Chairman, thank you again for this opportunity to represent our views on these important postal issues. We we'll gladly answer any questions you and your colleagues have. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Saraselli. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Marshall, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for uh, inviting the DMA to uh, give our comments on this important matter. I'm Jerry Sirisale, the Senior Vice President for Government Affairs for the DMA. DMA is an association, the largest American association of multi-channel marketers using the mail, internet, television, radio, telephone to reach customers and potential customers and also those who support those marketers. Mail is an important cog in direct <coughs> marketing industry in the United States which is has an effect of over $1.4 trillion on the American economy. The Postal Service needs flexibility in order to create an efficient transportation sorting and delivery network. And we support the Postal Service in those efforts and we supported the, the Reform Act giving the Postal Service management those tools to try and reach an efficient system. But we cannot and we must be vigilant against allowing realignment to become a hidden rate increase, a rate increase to, to mailers beyond the CPI cap. I'll give you a couple examples. One, change the time of delivery for bulk mail to a facility from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Think about a magazine that's necessary to get information out quickly. That is a huge cost to them because that eliminates an entire day. They have to change their entire operations. <coughs> Think about changing where you have to drop ship your mail. An example, an absurd example, but interesting example, you require JCPenney in Texas to, dr to enter their mail not in Dallas but in Chicago or our Donnelly to enter not in Chicago but in Dallas. Those are huge increases and just changing where you have to enter the mail can in fact be a hidden increase towards mailers. So we have to be aware of that as you look at realignment as well. Although Pulse Service is required and must work to realign the network, especially with diminishing first class mail volumes. The Reform Act also talked about service standards and that's one of the things uh, that you wanted to hear about today. Um, we hope that we are very cooperative with all the players in setting up these service standards, including the Regulatory Commission. I think we must start where we are, where the guidelines are, where the standards are now. That's a good starting place and where the negotiations should begin. But it, it's important to note that smaller mailers that mail nationwide, that are the bulk of DMA membership, and especially the nonprofit mailers, receive very, very poor service for mail that's going across the country. Standard mail can be two, three weeks to delivery. And in these day and age of our transportation networks, the Postal Service can and must do better. But again, in setting the goals, setting the standards, which we have to be met, that's only half the way. We have to have performance. The Postal Service must meet those standards. And that's important because as you've heard, mailers rely upon when the mail will go in to the home. And the Postal Service goal should be not to meet them 95% of the time, they should meet them 100% of the time. That is success, not 95%. <coughs> These measurement standards should be open for all to see. And it's important to understand that they meet them. Operators are hired, fulfillment people are hired, email messages, web page advertisements, in-store advertisements are all geared to when the mail is going to reach the potential customer. And it's important that they meet them. We know it, 
and the Postal Service meets it. And standard mail is unique. Direct mailers are unique because you have to meet it, not beat it. The same problems occur if the mail gets to the home before expected. The ads aren't there, the operators aren't there, the inventory may not be there. So in our ver view, you have to meet it, not beat it, not miss it, meet it. Um, we think it's important that the measurement standards, you can't have a measurement for each piece of mail, but it has to be regionalized. It has to be disaggregated enough so it's not just the entire Postal Service. We have to be able to measure and see where the problems are. Marketers have to know where the issues are, where do they have to change their entry. Maybe you get better service in one region than another and you have to change your pattern, your mailing pattern, in order to have the in-home date the same. I thank you for this opportunity and willing to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much and we will go to Mr. May. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> My name is Timothy May. I am a partner in the law firm of Patton Boggs and am general counsel of the Parcel Shippers Association on whose behalf I appear today. Uh, Parcel Shippers is an industry association whose members ship packages largely from businesses and, and consumers and companies that support those activities. Our main objective is, is to encourage a competitive environment that results in the best possible service at the lowest possible cost. Our members use all the private carriers as well as the Postal Service. Our members have a hand in the vast majority of the Postal Service's products in the package services class, which is now categorized as competitive products under the new law. They also ship and consolidate for delivery to the Postal Service hundreds of millions of packages, such as first class mail parcels, standard mail parcels, bound printed matter, and medium mail, and those are now categorized as market dominant products. And it is for those products that the Postal Service must in the future develop uh, measurement standards and reporting systems. And as at the moment, for most other mail, the market dominant mail, Postal Service really only has guidelines, even if, if you can call them that, rather than standards. And it doesn't really measure mail that consists of the most substantial volumes it delivers. Uh, for example, for uh, most packages, uh, the delivery is anywhere from two to nine days, depending on where you put it in and where it's going. And in the case of standard parcels, those less than a pound, the, the standards delivery in three to 10 days, depending upon how far it goes. Uh, but again, those really aren't standards. It's kind of a guideline, and we hope it gets there, and there's very little measurement of that. What our members want is a consistency of speed and reliability, and we're particularly concerned about products that are delayed beyond the expected time of delivery, which we all refer to as the tail of the mail. Those are the, 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 the several percentages of mail that just don't get there on time. Cons the customers are irate, all kinds of businesses lost, a lot of costs involved in reshipping to them, but as far back as 2000, parcel shippers asked the Postal Service for delivery standards, performance measurements, and reporting for a new category of package services called Parcel Select Service that was approved in 1999 by the Postal Rate Commission. That began a collaboration between our association and the Postal Service's Mailers Technical Advisory Committee to resolve issues such as how to start and stop the service clock and critical entry times. Those issues are now resolved today. We have excellent parcel select delivery standards. One day for parcels entered at the D D destination delivery unit, two days for parcels entered at the destination sectional center facility, and two to three days for parcels entered at the destination bulk mail facility. Now those are, that's excellent service and we are getting a very high performance, upwards of 98% on time. Last year, the General Accountability Office, and you had testimony today, issued a general, generally critical report on Postal Service delivery performance standards, but said that a noteworthy exception was the standards that evolved through the collaborative efforts of parcel shippers and the Postal Service for parcel select parcels. While these standards and reporting techniques were developed for what are now deemed to be the competitive products, we see no reason why that same or similar standards are not reasonable as well 
for market dominant packages. The Postal Service now measures and reports for us using delivery confirmation data that allows the service to be accurately measured and reported at a very detailed level. Parcel select shippers can get detailed summer reports regarding the performance delivery on their own parcels and can compare that with reports of aggregated data to see how they're doing compared to their peers. Much improved technology is now available, such as intelligent mail barcode, and that provides transparency, such as tracking and tracing. Unique identification of mail pieces should be the norm in the future, not the exception. Also in the future, any good performance measurement system to be effective will have to disaggregate data on the tail of the mail. That mail has got, that's there too late. How much is it? Where is it? So those packages are delivered later than the standard. The law now requires that six months after the development of the standards and measurement system, after that, the Postal Service has to file a plan to meet these standards, and also a central part of that plan deals with postal facilities. Congress found, as you know, that there were more facilities than the Postal Service needs and that streamlining of the distribution network could pave the way for potential consolidation of sorting facilities and the elimination of excess costs. Postal Service must detail its plan for this rationalization of the infrastructure. Postal Service was already at work on that prior to the enactment of the recent reform law and even docketed a proceeding at the Postal Rate Commission called the Evolutionary De Network Development Changes, or otherwise known as END, and you had some testimony uh, just pre prior to this uh, from uh, the director of the, at the Postal Rate Commission about that proceeding and the deficiency they, they found and the Postal Service's approach. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, Congressman, you, <laughs> uh, one of our large members, and we developed this information to give to the Postal Rate Commission, one of our large members in Dallas, big, uh, ships out of the bulk mail center in Dallas. One of the proposals, but again, this was all very sketchy, that one of the proposals of the Postal Service was to expand, to, to do away with the bulk mail facilities and substitute in their place up to perhaps 100 regional distribution centers. And in Texas, the, we, likely there would, if that were to happen, there would likely be five distribution centers in Texas instead of the one bulk mail center. Now, they're not going to move it to Chicago, but they did have plans to move it out of the BMC and to move it into these new regional distribution centers. <coughs> Our member calculated the additional costs to them of having to, sh to bring their parcels to five distribution centers around the state rather than the one BMC in Dallas, and also to have to, to, have to do away with bed loading because they were going to require containerization. And the, the amount of the cost to that mailer for those packages being shipped out of Texas, they estimated to be an increase of anywhere from 16 to 26 percent in their total costs. Now, the Postal Service had given no consideration to that whatsoever of the impact of that on mailers, the cost to mailers. So they simp that's simply unacceptable, and they, that has to be considered. Now, we've been working with the, the service, again, through the MTAC process, on end. Uh, our committees formally presented a position paper to MTAC on this restructuring, and that's attached to my testimony as Exhibit 1. That paper explains the principles we believe should guide the Postal Service that re realigns its network. Consistent deliveries, lower end to end cost and service, enhancing work sharing discounts, visibility, effective containerization, uh, not just uh, uh, and not eliminating bed loading unless that's necessary, and maximum automation. Service needs to heed advice from committees such as ours, uh, <coughs> and we believe that the success that we had in the consultative process on standards can be a model for the facility streamlining that has to take place. Obviously, that process requires consultation, not only with mailers, but with the communities affected and employees of the Postal Service, who will undoubtedly be affected. We hope that the subcommittee will continue to scrutinize carefully the progress the service makes in rationalizing its infrastructure and in formulating implementing new standards and measurements of service and reporting systems comparable to what we now have for Parcel Select. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Marchant, you have some questions? Yes. Um, uh, 
last week the subcommittee looked at the issues concerning outsourcing on the part of the Postal Service. Um, do you, you or your members or your clients have any views on the, uh, the whole concept of uh, outsourcing and uh, <coughs> in independent contractors? It's, uh, it's just, I mean, it, we're not per se opposed to outsourcing, but to us, we think you have to make the case for it. You have to demonstrate that it really cannot be done effectively in-house and that indeed you will save money by going uh, out, of, out of the service. And also, there are, uh, there are important considerations you have <coughs> with your empl employee agreements. The, 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 the contract the PMG just signed with the letter carriage union, for example, uh, does not allow them to uh, surplus any existing postal service carrier routes <laughs> by outsourcing them. <coughs> so the, the, you know, they don't have a free hand in this. And, uh, but as, as in private industry, uh, labor and management collectively bargains and they agree. The Postal Service is somewhat handicapped because under the present system they have to, uh, in an impasse, they have to go uh, to, to impasse arbitration and that's often been not satisfactory. But happily this time, for example, with the letter carrier's contract just uh, consummated, they were able to reach an agreement without having to go to arbitration. <coughs> but uh, certainly there will be occasions when there will be outsourcing, uh, but we don't have a position per se on it. I mean, we're, not, we're not urging that it be done. If it makes sense, do it, but it, it make the case that it does. Uh, Mr. Sarasel, do you, do you see uh, the effective uh, future of uh, the Postal Service as being effective uh, using uh, some kind of uh, outside contractors, do you see that as an essential part of, of a, a, an effective delivery system for your clients and customers? Well, the Postal Service has historically used contractors for transportation and so forth uh, in the past. Um, I agree with Mr. May that they have to make a, a case for it. One of the things for an efficient Postal Service and how it works, however, is that the, the labor management uh, cl uh, climate within the Postal Service. The Postal Service has to work and work well, and that means uh, management and their employees working together and working well, and it's part of, that's part of an, efi of an efficient Postal Service as well. We're not opposed to contra contracting out, but we're not saying that you have to contract out. We think that uh, right at the moment, it's, it's part of the collective bargaining uh, agreements, I think, with all the unions. And uh, the Postal Service has to work within that framework that it, that it currently has. I don't think you take it off the table. I don't think you say uh, it's not there. I think it, it, it's part of what the Postal Service has in front of it, part of the tools, and it has to work with it and with its employees. But an efficient Postal Service, one that works efficiently for us, is one that works with uh, its employees who, who are, uh, you know, we're their customers, or the both employees and the Postal Service, and so it has to work uh, t together. So that's a, a part of what efficiency is as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, gentlemen, during this part of the discussion, on two or three occasions I heard differentiation between guidelines versus standards. Oh, I heard mention that um, in some instances the service has guidelines but not standards. Uh, what's the difference? Well, <coughs> Mr. Chairman, a standard is something you have committed to that we, you will get delivery for, and, and for example, the commitment we have for parcel select standards is if we do, if we drop our packages at the destination delivery unit, that's the standard, which means we've been guaranteed and our customers can run on that. That's going to be delivered in one day, and we and with a 98 percent with a 98 percent success rate. So that's a standard. Again, a guideline is as well. It'll take anywhere from two to nine days, depending on where it is in the system. That's a guideline, and, uh, and frankly, uh, to the extent that they even measure it at all, it's less than 50% uh, accurate. So 
it, I mean, it, there's lots of work has to be done there. There's no reason why everybody can't have the same kind of standards and reportability and reliability that we've been able to achieve for Parcel Select by cooperating with the Postal Service. And you're wanting the Postal Service to move closer to a level of exactness. Absolutely, and we want, to, and we see no reason why, with uh, within s some tolerance, they can't have the same quick delivery, quick certain delivery guidelines and reporting systems for all mail, not just parcel select. Yeah, uh, from our view, what you measure is what you receive, and so the real key for these standards is we have to have measurement of those standards. That's where management will. Uh, put efforts and make sure they meet them. So the big key in service, creating service standards is the measurement in the, in the guidelines that we have. There really is not measurement there. The other key to this is that the uh, performance measurement that we're discussing today will be uh, much more detailed and will be made public. Uh, the standards that are, that are going to be established are, are a fine idea, but without the measurement they would essentially be meaningless. Today the Postal Service has two uh, measurement systems involving outside auditors. One measures the general public attitude towards the Postal Service, and the other uh, measures a very small percentage of a specific type of mail. Uh, these standards will be much broader as will the performance measurement systems, so we'll get a much better sense of how the Postal Service is doing when it comes to delivering uh, a large chunks of the mail that really provide almost 80 percent of their revenue uh, throughout the year, not just the revenue that comes from a very small subset of a, of a single class of mail. As the Postal Service goes through its thinking about realignment, um, are you all satisfied that you've got an opportunity for input into the process? Well, we certainly have. Uh, I mean, we have no complaints about that. Now, that, that doesn't mean they're going to uh, listen to us and agree with everything he said. But we have, pri pri largely through the Mailers Technical Advisory Committee process, we have, uh, they had, have and are continuing to have the opportunity to present our views on uh, standards for other package services and measurements, how they will be measured, and also our views, and we put it, and we will put it in writing eventually, is what our position is on the, re on the restructuring and the, uh, of the infrastructure of the Postal Service. And we, as I say, we, we've gone into print with that. It's attached to our testimony. Mr. Wynn, you were about to. I, I would have to answer that question as no, we have not had sufficient communication nor been really allowed to provide good input from our perspective. And I'll give you the example. We have consolidation facilities all over the country where we consolidate mail and then we drop ship at certain times at certain locations in the, in the Postal Service. The location of those facilities is critical to where we're entering mail. So if the network is realigned without visibility into what it's going to look like in the future, our consolidation facilities may be in totally the wrong places. We'll have to move increased costs to our customers. Again, total system cost. Mr. McGlynn. I think that, that where the Postal Service could improve in this area is by uh, talking to us more often and giving us more uh, lead time when it plans on, pl on changes, whether they are closing or consolidation. Uh, Mike, in his testimony, gave a great deal of attention to uh, the in-home delivery date, and that's what's really affected, as well as the transportation costs that mailers will uh, be required to pay. Uh, Mr. Galligan, the, test the uh, witness who uh, testified earlier today, has been very accessible to us, and we're in the process of trying to schedule a meeting with the Postmaster General and our entire membership sometime between now and the end of the year, and the network realignment will be one of the topics that we'll talk with them about. So we're seeing more accessibility. Uh, we just hope that we'll see uh, more information a little farther ahead than we have in the past. Sarah Sale. The accessibility is there. I don't necessarily think that we've seen all the information that we think uh, we should receive, and that's a really important part of uh, the discussion is take a look at the plans and then listen to us as we, as we talk on them. Uh, I think we are uh, encouraged by where the Postal Service is moving uh, on this, but um, the jury is still out whether or not they really are uh, giving us the plans and having some meaningful discussion on them. Well, it looks like our timing is perfect. Um, gentlemen, I want to thank you all for your testimony, for being here with us.
I want to thank all of the witnesses for appearing and all of those who have come. Of course, we've got a vote on it. I've got to go and vote, so this hearing is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.